So I got a text the other day that simply asked me uh, if I always believed God loved me. Did I ever suffer with doubt or feelings of unworthiness before God? And I honestly answered, no, I never suffered with those feelings. Uh, as I thought about it, uh, as a youngster, I uh, could answer that uh, one of the few benefits of legalism is that uh, I was told that if I kept the Sabbath, if I kept other rules and regulations and definitely never ate pork, God loved me. And so you may say that's an extremely shallow, in fact, bizarre answer. But that's where I began. Uh, the fact that I tried to do what God asked, and I knew that God was uh, fairly flexible because I had heard that if we say we don't have shortcomings, if we say we don't sin, then we're pretty stupid. But on the other hand, if we go back and we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a quote from John, uh, either 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John. You take your pick, but you can find it in one of those three. I think it's 1st John. And so uh, I uh, both uh, grew up with those misconceptions that God loved me because I was trying to be a good kid. And also, I leaned on scriptures like that quote from John. Now, uh, today, I'm going to read a little section from the book of Romans, and uh, it will give reasons why I still feel secure in God's love. Uh, you might title this, even though I uh, uh, wrote Rejoicing in Justification. That sounds very theological. Uh, you might uh, retitle it Six Reasons Why You Can Sigh With Relief. Because as you go through this particular section of Scripture, you'll see that Paul gives us six reasons to, if you will, sigh with relief. Now, this section of Scripture happens to be appointed to be read in the common lectionary. So there are hundreds and hundreds of churches across Canada and thousands worldwide that will be using this particular section of Scripture today. And as I was thinking about what to speak about, uh, you know, I looked at the common lectionary uh, used in the Church of England and in other uh, uh, denominations, and uh, this leapt out at me from Romans chapter 5. Verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that sufferings produce perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely would anybody die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. When Paul wrote this, he was living in Corinth, and he was working as a tent maker. And he was working as a tent maker because quite a few members of the church didn't think it was anything special that he should be supported in fact, he was not even accepted by some members of the church in Corinth. Uh, they uh, spoke of him as being squat, short, bald-headed. How anybody could object to that, I have no idea. But he was, his bodily appearance, they said, was weak and contemptible. And his, you know, his speech wasn't impressive. If you were a Jew, you liked to hear from a great orator or at least somebody who was able to philosophize about the, the Torah. 
if you were Greek or Roman, you, you wanted to see a tall, impressive individual who looked good in his, uh, in his robes or in his armor. You didn't want a short, squat little fellow, stooped over, squinty-eyed because his eyesight was just about gone, uh, showing all the ravages of having been beaten for his faith. You weren't impressed by that. But nonetheless, Paul, as he sat there for a couple of years with, uh, without family support, without too many friends, actually, but with the acquaintance of Priscilla and Aquila, who themselves had gone through a rough time, they'd been ejected from Rome, along with all the other Jews who were causing so much problem at that time. And he sat there and he talked with them and he listened to their stories about what was a, what were problems in the church in Rome. And in his mind, he rehearsed a thousand times what he was going to say to them if he ever got there. But then he realized he was never going to get there. At least he hoped, he dreamed about going to Rome on his way to Spain. He had no idea that he'd get to Rome okay, but he'd be in, in, in chains. And he'd get to Rome so he could be taken before the Senate. And as he said, to stand before the, uh, the beast, Nero, and be condemned. Uh, and uh, suffer humiliation and ridicule. He didn't envision that. But here, Paul, whose writings are considered to be among the most influential on Western civilization, uh, he had no idea as he sat there stitching a tent, feeling somewhat rejected, because uh, he writes about this a little bit later when he writes back to the Corinthian church uh, about the way he felt at times there. He had no idea that 2,000 years later, uh, thousands and thousands of churches around the world would be reading these words on this weekend. He had no idea that uh, despite the fact that uh, you might be a Jew, you might be an atheist, but nonetheless your civilization had been f f uh, shaped by the words of the Apostle Paul. Uh, our great Himalaya, uh, our great uh, poet laureate, uh, I call him the poet laureate, but uh, Leonard Cohen, you know, our, our great poet, our great uh, songwriter, a uh, great Canadian, uh, when he contemplated the future, he wrote those lines in that song, didn't he? Give me back the Berlin Wall. Give me Stalin or St. Paul. Give me Christ or give me Hiroshima. You know, as he tried to juxtapose these ideas. But here he, he conjures up somebody uh, in St. Paul who represents uh, uh, the juxtaposition between the horrors of today. And so think of this man. He's old, or at least oldish. He certainly feels old. And he's justifying in feeling rejected, somewhat stressed out, as I said, without a lot of family support or comfort from too many people, taking solace in this literally sewing circle in which he sits working away at the trade that his father taught him when he was 11, 12, 13, and he thought he'd never have to use, because after all, his towering intellect had served him well. And now he considers life, and he considers what it is in the midst of his difficulties and problems. And he says this among the six we statements, if you will. The first one is, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where he begins. We have peace. We rejoice because we have peace with God. And of course, that's where the question came from. Do you feel at rest? Do you have peace between you and God? And I said, yes. However, I came to that point. I'm, I'm, I'm at that point. I don't feel fear. Uh, I, I am this way because of what God has done, not what I have done. I feel this way as a result of God, what God wants for me, not as a result of any profound insight or understanding I came to. But I, I think of, uh, if, you, if you want a modern day uh, sort of example, um, you, you might say some people just know. If you grew up in England, some people just know that they are assured of whatever it is that they're, that, that they're entitled to. The fix is in. You know, I, uh, I grew up, I went to, first of all, what was called a secondary modern school, and uh, then I went to a comprehensive school that enabled you to sort of rise through the ranks. And uh, that comprehensive school became the model, uh, more or less, throughout England. But I had cousins, and uh, they all went to private schools. 
And uh, I was a little bit older than my cousins. And I asked my Uncle Bob one day why he'd sent Patrick and Marianne and uh, Jonathan uh, and Nick to uh, a private school. And I'd gone to see my cousins in the school. And I said, wouldn't it be better uh, if you just sort of gave them the lump of money you'd save by not sending them to private school? I was being a little bit cantankerous that day. And he said, uh, and my Uncle Bob was a farmer. And he said, well, you've got to realize that uh, your cousins go to the same school as the MP's son, uh, the same school as the archbishop's son, the same school as the mayor's son. You rub shoulders with the right people. Now, the irony is all my cousins went back to the farm. You know, Jonathan and Patrick became welders because that's what they wanted to do. Uh, Marianne became a flight uh, attendant and, uh, and flew around the world and lived in Australia. You know, my cousins did what they wanted to do and uh, they avoided university like the plague. And um, my, my brother and my sister, we went to comprehensive schools and ended up going to university. So the world was changing rapidly. But the idea was, if you sent your kids to the right schools, the fix was in. Uh, that you traveled through, especially if you went through Oxford and Cambridge, you, ca you traveled through with the same class, you moved into government service or military or something like that. The mafia have a similar equivalent. You ever heard the expression, a made man? Well, I, obviously not. No, no members of the mafia here. Uh, but if you, if you ever watch those mafia movies and somebody's hassling, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jimmy or uh, Guido or whatever name is, is, hey, I'm a made man. You can't impose upon me. I've paid my dues. I'm a made man. And I get to do whatever I want to do is the idea. I have standing and stature in the mafia. Uh, I, I, I think of a uh, very famous little clip that uh, gets played from time to time. Many, many years ago, John, President Kennedy was trying to do a, a television shtick, and uh, his little boy, uh, John, was uh, uh, under the desk, under the president's desk, you know, and you hear him say, you know, John, get out of there. We got to do this or we got to do that. Uh, but uh, here this little boy is entitled to play in the president's office because his dad is the president. You know, there were times when my dad gave me uh, security. Uh, I remember uh, we had uh, moved into town, and before I ever went, went to the new school I was supposed to go to, uh, we'd gone to the local swimming baths, as we call them in England, uh, indoor swimming pools. And somehow or other, I bumped against a kid who was uh, offended, and uh, he confronted me in the locker room, you know, and as a 12-year-old, I'm standing there uh, wondering whether he's going to beat me in the face first or kick me somewhere else. And a very, very, you know, obnoxious kid who challenged me to fight in the uh, locker rooms. And, and right in the next cubicle is my dad. And, of course, either way, if I get into a fight, I'm going to get, you know, uh, beaten down by this kid. Um, or if I'm victorious, my dad, who at the time, you know, we understood pacifist was the way to go and things like that. You know, you turn the other cheek. My dad would be rather unhappy with me. Uh, and I'm, I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. Do I get into a fight? and lose, uh, or, or, or do, I, do I try to win and get, get disciplined for not turning the other cheek? And just at the right time, my dad uh, stepped in and uh, encouraged the other kid. He said, uh, you know, why don't you break it up here, in a very soft voice. And this other kid who was uh, older and bigger than me, uh, he, uh, he figured that he wasn't, you know, an adult had spoken to him, so it was time to break it off. Uh, little moments like that, uh, I remember when I felt a sense of security. Um, in uh, Corinthians, Paul says this, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. That's reassuring, stepping into the grace of God. Uh, you're, you, the, the fix is in. I offer you the reassurance and the comfort. And uh, then he goes on to say, in fact, the next verse, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, accept this reconciliation to God, he writes to the Corinthians. So the great first reassurance Paul offers is this. 
we. And you have to sit next to him as he contemplates his own burdens and suffering. He said the first great reassurance is we have peace with God. You know, you don't have to worry and be frustrated and, and stressed out. And he goes on to add to this, we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. So the next we statement that he makes is, after we have peace with God, we are standing in grace. Now, the language here is sort of like we have been introduced to God. In, uh, in fact, those who analyze the Greek say it's like being given an audience with a king. You have been ushered into the presence of a king. But you notice that we are said to stand in this grace. You know, not grovel, okay, not feel insecure in it, but to stand. The implication is that you are solid, you're planted, you're stable in this. Uh, God is not uh, capricious. Uh, you know, if uh, it doesn't quite work out, uh, then he'll cut you loose, this sort of idea. Uh, he won't uh, sort of, I, I was just about to rehearse half a dozen examples from the last two weeks, but I've just been watching way too much of Trump news, uh, you know, so I, I won't even go there. Uh, but, you, you, you know, as they analyze the politics of who's doing what, and how this bill may fail or may go by. And now we see these sort of uh, snarky things being suggested about Speaker Ryan. And is this because they want to cut him loose or because they're supporting or And so I'm, I'm watching way too much of that. I realize this. And the instability of the currents that ebb and flow through the political scene. Well, you could feel that way if you were in the court of a, uh, a human king. You know, if you uh, displease the king, well, you know, off with your head. But we are told that we rejoice because we stand. There's a stability in God's grace. And we can stand there boldly, Paul says. You know, you come boldly before the throne of grace. You don't growl, you don't crawl. You come and express your confidence in that grace, in that reassurance. He goes on to add to that, next, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now, God's glory is something we can barely fathom, and we get glimpses of it through the scripture. But it's shown to us in Jesus. We have uh, stories like the transfiguration. We have uh, stories like uh, Jesus, uh, the resurrected Jesus, coming to the disciples and, uh, you know, just being able to pass through the wall because he is now uh, in a corporeal spiritual body. Uh, the incredible power and glory that he has as if he's toned it down. Eventually in the ascension they see him ascending into the incredible glory, the Shekinah glory of God. And so Paul says, we, we are rejoicing. He uses the word boasting. Um, in other contexts, he'll say, you know, boasting is precluded. But he is saying here that we, we take great confidence and joy in the glory of God because we are destined to share that. And that's the constant sort of emphasis. Uh, Paul, again, sitting in the sewing circle, as he meditates about this, he writes later back to the Corinthians about the mortal putting on immortality, the, the idea of a new body, the idea of a new lease on life as we step into eternal life. And he says these are things he rejoices in. Why? Because he has aches, he has pains, he has suffering. I uh, talk uh, Occasionally to those who don't share my faith, my confidence. And when they talk about their bodies because of injury or accident, uh, they'll, uh, they'll be discouraged. And there's no doubt that Paul at times was discouraged by just the, the wear and tear that he had suffered in life. But he says here that he, that this is one of the great things that motivates him, the glory that he's going to step into when he receives the future. And that he anticipates that this life will come to an end, but it'll be a transition into life everlasting. It's, you know, it's a mindset. 
I, I was talking to a, a kid, a youngster, uh, call him that. He, he must be at least my age because we were in the same class. Uh, so, which means he's, well, I guess you'd say ancient, wouldn't you, Jim? Yes. <laughs> but he, he was talking about um, actually one person and who, for the most part, I really respected and, uh, 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 you know, appreciated. But he was talking about the fact that this particular uh, professor, instructor, had had uh, told him that uh, essentially he wouldn't amount to anything, which was kind of harsh. Uh, his name's Fred, okay, and uh, he's quite ebullient, quite expressive and so forth. But he told Fred that you won't, you won't amount to anything. You're just a waste of space here at Ambassador College. Now, I don't know exactly the context in which he was told that. I, I know somebody else told me a story about Dr. Hay. They, said, they talked about um, they'd gone to the uh, initial beach party, which began every year, at least in Pasadena. And uh, Dr. Hay was, uh, how can I put it tactfully, somewhat eccentric. Uh, he had gone to the beach in his suit and tie and, uh, you know, regular uh, formal shoes, and he was standing there on the beach, you know, watching over the students, I suppose, at the start of the year, uh, as they enjoyed the beach party in their swim shorts. But uh, one young man walked up to him and uh, was was heard to say, uh, Dr. Hay, I just feel so out of place here. I feel so inadequate and unqualified and just just inferior uh, to everybody else around here. And apparently Dr. Hayes' response was, that is because you are inferior. Which, which you might say is a harsh and nasty and terrible thing to say. But uh, Dr. Hayes' next comment was, that is why you are here. And we are going to help you to do something about that. In other words, you've come here to get an education. Uh, to get some affirmation of your worth, uh, to to build a life. And uh, so we'll take those feelings as honest, and we'll start from there, and we'll show you how to mature uh, and to become a man. Uh, on the other hand, apparently this individual, we'll call him Ray, uh, Ray told Fred, you won't have to, you know, he won't matter to anything. Some years later, Fred was working around Pasadena. He and his wife, who uh, was a delightful lady, uh, always enjoyed her company. And uh, they were in property management. And of all things, Ray and his wife moved in to take over a, an apartment block uh, that uh, Fred and Alice had been managing. And I guess Fred couldn't, uh, he, he did have a little bit of a sort of a, on a rare occasion, a motor mouth. He would say things, but he told Ray what he thought of him. And uh, isn't it not exactly the best way to put it, but he said, uh, you know, the last four or five years I've been busy building a career and a business here, and uh, I'm making six figures, what about you? You know, now, that's no basis for comparison or anything like that. But I couldn't help but feeling what a stupid thing it was to say to Fred, you'll never amount to anything. You know, who in their right mind says that? He must have been having a really bad day, because I know Ray never said that to me, and he could well have said that on occasion when he observed my blunders or mistakes. And, uh, you know, and by and large, he was thought of as a wise man. But to say that to somebody, and here Paul's perception, okay, of his future is we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That's what I anticipate, he says, in God. I find reason to anticipate nothing but good things. And so who, who is somebody like Ray to inject a thought like, well, as far as I'm concerned, you, you don't have anything to anticipate. You're a complete failure. Actually, Fred went on to build a good business, uh, had some uh, very fine kids, uh, looks to be still very happily married to Alice and, uh, you know, uh, actually confided in me that he, really those were the best years of our lives. Fred and I got into trouble once and, uh, boy, I shouldn't go down that road, should I? Uh, but he, he was, he was a, you know, a nice, nice, uh, a nice guy, a, a, a good friend. It was nice to see him again. But to hear him, you know, 50 years later, you know, pull that up out of nowhere. You know what Ray said to me? He said, you know what I said to him? 
whoa, don't go back there too far, buddy. Life has been too good since then to, and, you know, go back and rehearse that. But Paul has uh, his third point, you know, we have peace with God, we stand in God's grace, we rejoice in anticipation of nothing but good things from God. He goes on to say, we also glory in our sufferings. Now, if we went on to read this, we would uh, see how he uh, equates this to sufferings. Uh, you might say it's a little bit of Nietzsche here. Well, it doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. Uh, but we know suffering does produce perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And that character he is talking about is the character of God within us. I, uh, I bumped into one guy. I, uh, it's actually a distant, well, I, I think maybe a cousin or second cousin or something to Vice President George Cheney. But I never forgot the name George Cheney, uh, this George Cheney. Because uh, the summer of 69, I had gone to, uh, gone to a, the, the Big Sandy campus. And uh, several of us had gone there. And we're going to work on the campus. We ended up working on the ranch. Uh, but uh, here, the first Friday night uh, Bible study, uh, Les McCullough, who was a stark contrast to our faculty in Bricketwood, uh, he sat down and uh, in his drawl, you know, his Texas drawl that he used to have, he said, well, sure been a good summer so far. And of course, all except the fact that George shot himself. I thought, George? And here I am talking to George 50 years later. Uh, his name is George Cheney. Uh, he lives in Idaho, and uh, he uh, he said every now and then we come up to Alberta. We we love to visit there. But uh, I remember the the story. I said, you know, did you really shoot yourself? He said, oh yeah. I still got this scar right here, and his wife's standing there. And she said, yeah. I thought the wedding would be off after that. She said, you know, uh, uh, but he just was putting his gun in the holster, and he ripped a bullet through his thigh. And uh, that was rather embarrassing. But Les McCullough's way of handling it was to just say, you know, well, just one of those things that happens in East Texas. You know, George shot himself. And uh, the he George, I said, you know, How, well, how's life going? He said, um, and, and he's a couple of years older than me, and he said, I'm, uh, he said, I'm still, uh, he said, I'm still uh, working, he said. Uh, he said, I'm not a big fan of, uh, of uh, Barack Obama. Uh, he said what had happened was he was working for General Motors when they were bailed out. And somehow or other he was working for the Saturn Division or something. And his entire um, retirement fund was wiped out during the uh, uh, restructuring or the bankruptcy that the whole division had gone through. And so he said, yeah, he said, I'm, you know, he's several years older than I am, I suppose. He said, I'm still working because I had no retirement fund. And, uh, you know, he's not suffering too badly, but that was a huge thing, I suppose, having invested for 20 or 25 years working for a division of GM to see it just disappear like that. It was a, a great trauma. And I look at this and I see, uh, you know, what was the point of that? Uh, the point of that was just pointless. You know, uh, people had to suffer because of others who manipulated the economy and did things that were wrong. And here Paul says, look, I, I've had suffering, uh, but my suffering leads somewhere. My suffering is going to be a continuum onto the character and the inheritance of Jesus Christ, my Savior. Uh, in other words, when you and I go through things, um, it doesn't have to be a pointless experience. It has value. It has purpose. Uh, because God intends it to have value and purpose. He just doesn't leave us to suffer through this world and say, well, just endure it, and whatever happens, you know, that's okay. You know, a lot of things happen, and uh, they aren't okay. In fact, they're very uneven. Um, I, I learned many, many years ago that, uh, in fact, when I was first in ministry, and I was young and newly married, um, people who would uh, come to our home and, let's say, sit down and want to share 
their journey, their, their, their challenges and so forth. Uh, they were always respectful towards me, but, you know, I didn't have a lot of experience. My wife had been through some difficult times. She'd been a single mom when I met her, and now she was, uh, she was married, brackets, happily to me, unquote. And uh, people were drawn to the fact that uh, she had life experiences to share. Because often people would come and they talk about, I'm going through this. I remember the first big family counseling I, uh, I went through and uh, with all of, uh, you know, four months of marriage, I suppose, experience and now probably a full year in ministry. Here was a man asking me how to get along with his teenage daughter who was stressing him out. Never forget him. His name was Cecil. He told me a couple of years later that after we had finished counseling, he wanted to kill me because I clearly didn't understand the pain he was going through. And I wasn't in tactless, you know, but this, uh, it wasn't a uh, therapeutic session. It was a sharing session as he poured out his heart and I had to tell him honestly, uh, you're going to really have to suck it up here and you're going to have to give a certain amount and you're going to have to change uh, to a certain extent because there were certain things that were obvious. And he didn't like that. And especially it was hard to take from someone who was younger, less experienced as far as he was concerned, and did not have the, uh, the wounds of life that he was suffering with. Uh, he, he came from a family of 12 kids, and, uh, and uh, a little bit later I got to know his dad very well because he became a deacon in the congregation, uh, Gilbert Murphy. And uh, he was, uh, I had gone to school with uh, his youngest, number 12, Betty Ann Murphy. Uh, but here Cecil told me just simply, you know, it's tough to take any advice from a kid, you know. And Cecil was uh, at least 15, if not 20 years older than me. And I was really tactful, I thought, and really humble. But people found it much more, let's say, insightful in those early years to learn from my partner, uh, who had gone through some difficult times, uh, whose suffering had produced perseverance, and had that perseverance produced character, and produced something good. So I said, George Cheney just went through suffering because people were dishonest and things crashed. And, uh, you know, uh, he, he couldn't smile about that, and I, I didn't blame him. Uh, on the other hand, my sufferings and my setbacks have all been used in some way or another to build something within me that God wants to build. Um, he goes on to explain that, look, uh, you know, you, you, you feel that your suffering may be pointless, but uh, before you ever suffered, Jesus Christ suffered for you. So you might want to put it in that context. So look at the setbacks and trials and uh, count the fact that it's a blessing that God is working with you through these times. In fact, you read this simply, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, he died for us. And since we've now been justified or set right, lined up, uh, made correct in our relationship with God uh, by his blood, not, not by anything we did, but by this sacrifice that Jesus offered, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, he reconciled us to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Uh, in other words, uh, we, we know that we are secure. He, he went out on a limb for us long before we even knew that we needed that. And so having accomplished that, you can rejoice in knowing you are going to be secure in your salvation. You're not going to come to the end and uh, sort of have a, sort of a, a thumb up or a thumb down or a failing grade. There is no such thing to face. You have what some term eternal security. Now it's true, you have free will, and uh, you can walk away from that. But God will never walk away from his commitment to you. So we will know, Paul says, that we will be secure. We will be saved. And that he guaranteed that even before we knew what was happening. 
even before we knew that we might wish that to be the case. And so all of these things have led us into a very secure place. And then he adds to this, not only is this so, but we also boast or we rejoice or we take gladness in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And the challenge there is to think about God, which, of course, if you're sitting in a sewing circle, hour after hour after hour, uh, your mind is not going to be too occupied. Maybe you've got to be careful you don't stick the, you know, the, the uh, needle in your thumb or something. But Paul is meditating on how awesome God is. Sometimes we even sing that. Our God is an awesome God. Uh, he's, he's incredible. He is powerful. He is, well, he's everything we see. I, I have to say, we are encouraged to, to see God where? In Jesus Christ. And it may not be the best way for you, but uh, uh, every now and then I've seen a movie, or especially the Matthew series by Bruce Marciano, that helped me to understand what a beautiful person Jesus was. I don't mean beautiful in the fashion sense, but I mean uh, just in his being, uh, the way he is compassionate, humorous, but unyielding in his righteousness, uh, the way he just lived his life, uh, the uh, beautiful and wise things that he said, so wise they echo down 2,000 years later and still speak to us, both emotionally and spiritually. And in Jesus, we see a God. It's difficult to meditate on God who is spirit. All right? That's the great mystery of godliness. But it is possible to meditate on Jesus as the Christ. As, you know, even in the, the midst of his suffering, you remember Pilate, you know, just leads him out before the crowd and simply appeals to them and says, you know, in the midst of their anger and their rage, behold... The man, he is a person, he is a strong, clear-thinking, logical, compassionate, reasonable man. What is your problem? And uh, the more you're able to envision that, as I said, maybe I'm just a, a product of this day and age, but I, if I can see video, if I can see things that will... Uh, just bring that alive so that it's not just words on paper. It helps me to think more. And uh, since I know we will always relate to God through Jesus the Christ, the man Christ Jesus, it's important to me to try to picture that. And that's what Paul is saying. We can think about, we can rejoice in God himself. Now, like Paul, we have all been through, and a lot of us are older, uh, especially today as we acknowledged uh, all these uh, St. Patrick's Day birthdays. It's not a bad thing to admit. Uh, we're, we're, well, some of you are a year older. Not me, but some of you. Uh, you've, uh, you ticked over yesterday. And uh, we, have, uh, we have many of us lost loved ones. Uh, and I think, I think we could probably look at Paul's life. He must have been married to be in the Sanhedrin. And now he founds himself a single person. I don't know whether he had children or not, but uh, some of us have gone through the, children, uh, the, the trial of burying children. Uh, some of us have, a lot of us have gone through the trial of burying parents. Uh, we've known illness. We've known setbacks. We've known disease. We have uh, suffered uh, the ravages of this life. And in some way or another, I believe all of you uh, sat next to Paul. Uh, you sat in that circle and tried to understand life and try to come to ask the question, how can I rejoice in God? And why can I rejoice? Especially when you feel the pain of experiences like this. And, uh, and Paul has tried to encourage us with uh, this. He's tried to answer the question, as I said, that uh, came my way. How do you know God loves you? Uh, how, do you? how do you feel that? How does it work itself out in your life? And Paul says, well, we rejoice because we have peace. 
We rejoice because we stand in grace. We rejoice because we have hope. We rejoice because even our sufferings make sense and they lead us somewhere. And he will make them uh, work for us, not against us. Uh, We rejoice because we know we are secure and our salvation is assured at the end of this journey that there's a blip in the road called death and we step into life everlasting. We rejoice, in fact, in God himself. The more we meditate upon him, the more we realize that he is our father in heaven or, if you wish, our elder brother. He's the one who says there's space on the throne for you and me together, uh, who wants us in his presence. And so as you think about the question, how, how, how do you find reassurance that God loves you? Paul answers that. And I think he answers it very clearly and directly. I hope that speaks to you because as I consider it today, it certainly speaks to me. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, to understand you, we read Paul. We try to fathom his suffering and his life. And uh, we try to see in our lives the parallels and the experiences And we thank you that uh, there's nothing that with you goes to waste. There's nothing that is pointless. Uh, There's nothing that is futile. That you've given us purpose and you've given us mission in life. Uh, You've given us meaning. Uh, You've also given us assurance of the future and that we anticipate and look forward to. We've uh, lost a lot of friends over the last decade or two. Uh, We've seen a lot of pain, a lot of loss and suffering. We've also seen a lot of rejoicing. A lot of fun, a lot of good times. Even though we joke about it, uh, so many positive things just yesterday uh, as we count off yet another year that brought accomplishment, brought growth, brought joy, brought pleasure. We thank you for all of these things as we experience life and we journey with you, strengthening each other, encouraging each other, because we know that we are secure and comforted in you. So we thank you today for that understanding in Jesus' name. Amen.